Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Outlaws and Gunslingers Mafia Edition once again. Once again, if you listened to us last week, you heard us come off the Havana and Atlantic City conferences. Lots of big decisions were made, including at the Havana conference where Bugsy Siegel's fate was decided ultimately, and um, the Havana or the Atlantic City one where they pretty much said, "Hey, stop killing each other, and we can make some money off of booze, guys." Right. So booze and drugs. Um, with that. We finally break into covering family by family. Like we said, first up is the Genovese crime family, otherwise known as the Morello crime family, started way back in. It is the oldest of the Tis. of the families. So, mm-hmm. and um, right now, everybody knows after Morello, it was Maranzano, right? And then after Maranzano, it was Luciano, and now uh, kind of in that little period where Luciano's. Um, currently banned from the U.S., and we got Frank Costello and Vito Genovese um, struggling with each other, which technically Frank Costello was the first boss after Luciano, so we'll start with him, and then we'll cover Vito next week. But both of their stories end up the same, pretty much. Yeah, they uh, all do. Old Frankie Costello was born on January 26, 1891, in Laura Poli, which is a frazione of the town of Cassano Al- Alolonio, in the province of Casenza, in the Calabria region, in Italy. Okay, <laughs> Italy. Why does it have to have 700,000 right. names, dude? Freaking the <sighs> Jersey. Right. <laughs> in 1895, he boarded a ship to the United States with his mother and his brother, Edward, to join their father, who had moved to New York's East Harlem several years earlier and opened a small neighborhood Italian grocery store. Why did he just go by himself? Right. When Casella was still a boy, his brother introduced him to the gang activities. Age 13, he had become a member of the Five Points Gang, which we covered, started using the name Frankie Oh, after uh, Americanizing his Italian name from, which was Francesco S- Constiglia. 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 Castiglia. Yeah, I got to Americanize it. All right. You're not going to be accepted. Uh-uh. Costello then started to commit a bunch of petty crimes, and he went to jail for assault and robbery in 1908, 1912, and 1917. 1918, he married Loretta Geigerman, who was a Jewish woman who was the sister of a close friend. Hmm. That same year, he served 10 months in jail for carrying a concealed weapon. He would not go to prison again for over 40 years. Look at that. He did it once. He was like, mm-mm. Well, a little more serious than the <laughs> when he does go in 40 years. Though. Well, he went to work for the Morello gang. Costello met Charlie Lucky Luciano, the Sicilian leader of Manhattan's Lower East Side gang. The two Italians immediately became friends and partners. Several older members of Luciano's mob family, they disapproved of this growing partnership. They were mostly old school mafiosi who were unwilling to work with anyone who was not Italian and skeptical at best about working with non Sicilians, which uh, Costello is not a Sicilian. He's a Calabrian. Right. To Luciano's shock, they warned him against working with Costello, whom they called the Dirty Calabrian. Yeah, Calabrians. Luciano's they, like, well, dude, dude, Sicily and Calabria. Had their whole separate mafia, dude. Don't you think Lucky would have been like, didn't you guys learn from uh, Maranzano? And well, this hasn't happened yet. Oh, that's right. He's, he's like, we don't want you old school bastards. You're right. ruining everything. And they're like, oh, I see why. <laughs> All right. I see why they only did that. Well, along with Italian American associates Vito Genovese and Tommy Three Finger Brown Lucchese, plus Jewish associates Meyer Lansky and Benjamin Buggy, Bugsy Siegel, the game. The gang became involved in robbery, theft, extortion, gambling, narcotics, you know, the usual mafia stuff. Right. Uh, the Luciano Costello Lansky Siegel Alliance, they need a new name for that, prospered even further with the passage of the Prohibition in 1920. Sure did. The gang then went into bootlegging, backed by criminal financier Arnold the Brain Rothstein, hmm. or Rothstein, probably. Those damn Rothsteins. <laughs> Those damn Rothsteins. The young Italian success. Let them make business deals with leading Jewish. <laughs> Not only were there business deals, there were bigness deals. <laughs> bigness, <laughs> bigness deals. Uh, he did this with uh, leading Jewish and Irish criminals of that era, including Dutch Schultz, Oni the Killer Madden, and William Big Bill Dwyer. Oh, Big Bill. Rothstein, he became a mentor to Costello, Luciano, Lansky, and Siegel, while they conducted bootlegging business with Bronx beer baron uh, Schultz. 1922, Costello Luciano and their closest Italian associates joined the Sicilian crime family, led by Joe the Boss Masseria, a top Italian underworld crime boss, obviously. 
By 1924, Costello had become a close associate of Hell's Kitchen's Irish uh, crime bosses, Dwyer and Madden. He became involved in all their rum-running operations, known as the Combine. The Combine. This might have prompted him to change his last name to the Irish Costello. Right. He knew he wasn't going to get in with the Italian mob at first. 1925, Costello became a U.S. citizen. Good for him. November 19, 26, Costello and Dwyer were indicted on federal bootlegging charges. They were accused of bribing. T- I thought he wouldn't go to jail for 40 more years. Maybe he's going to get off. They were accused of bribing two U.S. Coast Guardsmen, presumably so they would not disturb the unloaded of liquor from boats in New York Harbor. Well, I would assume so. Right. The largest boat in the Combine fleet could carry 20,000 cases of liquor. Dang. January of 1927, the jury deadlocked on the bootlegging charges for Dwyer and Costello. Okay, 1926, Dwyer. He was convicted of bribing a Coast Guard official and sentenced to two years in jail. After Dwyer was in prison, Costello took over the Combine's operations oh, with Madden. This caused friction between Madden and a top Dwyer lieutenant, Charles Vanny Higgins. He's like, ah, uh, this should be m- my uh, position here. Or are you guys trying to cut the boss out? Right. Uh, he 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 believed that he should have been running oh, the combine that. instead of Castell. He's like, dude, I be- I'm I'm freaking Dwyer's right hand man. All right. You can bring in this dude out of nowhere. This started the Manhattan Beer Wars, which began between Higgins on one side and Castello, Madden, and Schultz on the other. At this time, Schultz was having problems with gangsters Jack Legs Diamond and Vincent Mad Dog Cole, who had begun to rival Schultz and his partners with Higgins' help. Eventually, the Costello Madden Schultz alliance was destroyed by New York's underworld. Oh, wow. Yeah, because Jack Legs Diamond, right. I remember they were talking about him at the uh, mm-hmm. Atlantic City. Or the Havana one, one of them, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, late 1920s, Johnny Torrio helped organize a loose cartel of East Coast bootleggers, which were called the Big Seven, in which a number of prominent gangsters, including Costello, Luciano, Longy Swillman, Joe Adonis, and Meyer Lansky, played a part. Torrio also supported a creation of a national body that would prevent the sort of all-out turf wars between gangs that had broken out in Chicago and New York. His idea was well-received, and at the conference as the aforementioned Atlantic City by Torrio, Lansky, Luciano, and Costello, the National Crime Syndicate, was created. Nice. See, they're like, man, we got to do something here. Right. We got an organization now. Right. Early 1931, the Castella Marisi War broke out between Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano. In their secret deal with Maranzano, Luciano agreed to engineer the death of his boss, Masseria, which we know. He did that in return for three, receiving Masseria's rackets and becoming Maranzano's second in command. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we all know that because we read it. <laughs> 15th Just eight. so you know, you guys, I think I said this on the last episode, you're going to hear a lot of repeat stuff, especially early on here. Right. Just yeah, in case you forgot, 15th of April, 1931, Luciano lured Masseria to a meeting where he was moited at a restaurant called the Nuova Villa Tamaro on Coney Island. Sorry if I said that wrong, you Coney Islanders. While they played cards, Luciano allegedly excused himself to the bathroom, with the gunmen reportedly being Genovese, Albert Anastasia, Joe Adonis, Ciro, the artichoke king, Terranova drove the gateway car. But legend has it that he was too shaken up to drive away and he had to be shoved out of the driver's seat by Bugsy. Yeah. Well, Luciano then took over Masseria's family, clearly, with Genovese as his underboss. September 1931, Luciano and Genovese planned the murder of Maranzano as well. Luciano had received word that Maranzano was planning to kill him and Genovese and prepared a hit team to kill Maranzano first. September 10, 1931, Marizano summoned Luciano, Genovese, and Costello to a meeting at his office. And they all thought, I think they're going to kill us here. Right. Instead, Luciano sent Marizano's office to Marizano's office four Jewish gangsters whose faces were unknown to Marizano's people. They had been secured with the aid of Lansky and Siegel. After a San Sede and Marizano, Luciano subsequently created the commission, which we have a whole episode on, to serve as the governing body for right. organized crime. They're getting away from the old school over, you know, old country way of doing mm-hmm. it like dude we need to work with other people that aren't italians right if you guys want that go back to sicily right here we're doing stuff different baby 1931 after the deaths of Mazzaria and maranzano luciano became the leader of the new luciano crime family with genovese as underboss and costello as consigliere costello quickly became one of the biggest oinas for the luciano family and began to carve his own niche in the underworld he controlled the slot machine and bookmaking operations for the family with associate Philip Dandy Phil Castle. Costello placed approximately 25,000 slot machines in bars, restaurants, cafes, drugstores, 
gas stations and also bus stops throughout New Damn, York. Damn, bus stops? That's smart. Damn right. Why don't they have that nowadays? Why don't you put them at uh, horse racing tracks? All right. Well, they're like, no. <laughs> 1934, Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia. Hey, LaGuardia, huh? LaGuardia. Uh, confiscated thousands of Costello slot machines, loaded them on a barge, and dumped them into the river. What? Oh, wonder if there's some money down there. <sighs> Costello's next move was to accept Louisiana Governor Huey Long's proposal to put slot machines throughout Louisiana for 10% of the take. Hey. Damn, look at this guy. Castello made Casto overseer of the Louisiana slot operation at this time. Yeah, look at these guys. Then Casto held... Uh, Castle had the assistance of New Orleans mafioso Carlos Little Man Marcello, or Marcello. Costello brought in millions of dollars in profit from slot machines and bookmaking to the Luciano family. Dude, hell yeah. Especially down in New Orleans. Right. Dude. Damn, that's smart. And then that guy from New Orleans, what, the governor said? The mayor. Oh, the mayor from the city? Yeah, yeah. man. He's like, hell yeah, I'll take some of that. Damn, you see how fast he heard that shit. Right. Like, They're going up in New York. They won't let him do the slot machines. like, what? Are they stupid? Well, I wonder if the New York mayor wanted like 25%, I bet. Maybe. Right. He's like, oh, went a lot. Luciano's like, how about you stay alive? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, how about I just, uh, damn, no retaliation either. Just dumped all the slot machines in ammo. Yeah, I don't think they're messing around with the politicians. Right. We already seen that they don't want to do that. Mm-mm. 1936, Luciano was convicted of running a prostitution ring, sentenced 30 to 50 years in state prison. He attempted to rule the crime family from prison with the help of Costello and Lansky, but he found it to be too difficult. Clearly. With Luciano's imprisonment, Genovese became acting boss of the Luciano crime family. 1937, Genovese. Isn't that crazy that the underboss right. becomes the pretty much the leader, even though the consigliere is the guy's right-hand man? Right. Weird. That's how it goes, man. 1937, Genovese was indicted for a 1935 murder. He fled to Italy to avoid prosecution. Luciano, he then appointed Costello as acting boss. His un- So, basically, yeah, Luciano's still... Well, right. Right. His underboss was his cousin, Willie Moretti. Hey! From May of 1950 to May of 1951, the United States Senate conducted a large-scale investigation of organized crime, commonly known as the Cafalva hearings. This was chaired by Senator Estes Cafalva of Tennessee. Well, those Kefauver hearings that we just mentioned was a special committee of the United States Senate, which existed from 1950 to 51. Uh, they investigated organized crime, clearly. The term cap or capo di tutti capi was first introduced to the public by this commission. Oh. Organized crime was a subject of a large number of widely read articles in several major newspapers and magazines in 1949. Fantastic. They would love this stuff. Right. Several local crime commissions, quote-unquote, in major cities and states had also uncovered extensive corruption of the political progress by organized crime. Many cities and states called for federal help in dealing with organized crime, yet federal law provided few tools for the U.S. government mm-hmm. to do so. Right. In particular, many cities and states were concerned with the way organized crime had infiltrated in-state or interstate commerce right. and how it had threatened to hold the American economy oh, hostage good. through labor racketeering. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, they had to do something about Midwest. it. Especially in the Midwest. Oh, right. Right. It was rough. January 5th, 1950, Senator Estes Kefauver, he was a Democrat in Tennessee, introduced a resolution that would allow the Senate, Senate, that would allow the Senate Committee on the Judiciary to investigate organized crime roles in interstate commerce. He's like, can we finally do this? He's like, yes. However, the Senate Committee on Interstate and Foreign Commerce already claimed jurisdiction over this very issue. A compromise resolution was substituted, which established a special committee of five senators, whose membership would be drawn from both the Judiciary and Commerce Committees. Debate over the substitute resolution was bitter and partisan, and the voting on the resolution extremely close. May 3rd, 1950, Vice President Elbin Barkley, sitting his role as President of the United States Senate, cast the tie-breaking vote, and the Special Committee to Investigate Crime and Interstate Commerce was established. <laughs> Wait a minute. There we had a Vice President of the United States named Elbin Barkley? <laughs> was he Truman's guy? Yeah. Well, Barkley, as the president of the Senate, was empowered to choose the committee's members, which included Kefauver, Robert O'Connor from Maryland, Lester C. Hunt from Wyoming, Alexander Wiley from Wisconsin, oh, the old Wiley Wisconsiner, right. and Charles W. Toby from uh, New Hampshire. Fantastic. The Kefauver committee held hearings in 14 major cities across the United States. More than 600 witnesses were testified. Damn. Or t- did testify. Many of the committee's hearings were televised live on national television to large audiences, providing many Americans with their first glimpse of organized crime uh, and their influence in the United States. Among the more notorious figures who appeared before the committee were Tony Joe Batters Accardo, 
Louis, Little New York Campania, hmm. Mickey Cohen, Willie Moretti, Frank Costello, Jake Greasy Thumb Guzik, Meyer Lansky, Paul the Waiter Rika, Virginia Hill, who was the former Joe Adana Chicago Outfit Messenger and Mobster uh, Benjamin Siegel's girlfriend, Bugsy's, no. and four of Irish mob boss Enoch Nucky Johnson's former policemen in Atlantic City were also called forth. Okay. Kefauver became a nationally recognized figure, and the committee enabled him to run for president of the United States in 52 and 56, which clearly failed, but he became his party's vice presidential nominee in 1956, though, for him. Oh, Good for yeah. him. And they failed as well. I'm pretty sure 56. It would have been Truman again, right? Yeah, there was no vice president Kefauver. Well, um, JFK was 1960. Who was before JFK? Uh, what's his face? Eisenhower. Yep. Many of the Kefauver committee hearings were aimed at proving that a Sicilian Italian organization based strong family ties centrally controlled a vast organized crime conspiracy in the United States. Like these Sicilian Italians. With strong family ties, they control a vast majority of the organized crimes in the United States. But the committee never came close to justifying such a claim. No, that wouldn't even happen until the um, commission trial in the 80s. Rather, the committee uncovered extensive evidence that people of all nationalities, ethnicities, and religions operated locally controlled. Oh, no shit. Like, they didn't already know this. Loosely organized crime syndicates at the local level. Yeah, right. The committee's final report, issued on 17th April 1951, included 22 recommendations for the federal government and seven recommendations for state and local authorities. Among its recommendations were the creation of a racket squad within the United States Department of Justice, the establishment of a permanent crime commission at the federal level, the expansion of the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee to include interstate organized crime, federal studies into the sociology of crime, a ban on betting via radio, television, telegraph, and telephone, the establishment, the establishment of state and local crime commissions, and a request that the Justice Department investigate and prosecute 33 named individuals as suspected leaders of organized crime in the United States. I'd say that's pretty... Uh, <laughs> I think they did a good job. Right. Huh? All right. The committee's work led to several significant outcomes. Among the most notable was an admission by J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, that a national organized crime syndicate did exist and that the FBI had done little about it. Legislative... <laughs> Legislative proposals and state ballot referendums legalizing gamblings. If anybody's followed us and know about J. Edgar Hoover, you'd know why this is funny. Yeah, go look up our Prohibition uh, episodes. <sighs> Just look up J. Edgar Hoover. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. We should have done a whole episode on that guy. Uh, legislative proposals and state ballot referendums legalizing gambling went down to defeat over the next few years due to revelations of organized crime's involvement in the gambling industry. And more than 70 crime commissions were established at the state and local level to build on the Kefauver Committee's work. The Kefauver Committee was the first to suggest that civil law be expanded and uh, used to combat to combat organized crime. Okay, Congress responded to the call and in 1970 passed the infamous RICO Act as a direct response to the committee's recommendation. Hmm. Damn, okay. It's fantastic. Senator Kefauver served as the committee's first chairman, clearly. He relinquished the committee chair on April 30th, 1951, and Senator O'Connor assumed the chairmanship until the committee folded September 1st, 1951. That's very long. No. Well, did what it needed to do, I guess. TV broadcasts of the committee's hearings attracted huge public interest and educated a broad audience about the issues of municipal corruption and organized crime. Police and gangsters. Who do you trust? Right. An estimated 30 million people in the United States tuned in to watch the live proceedings in March of 1951. And at the time, 72% of the population were familiar with the committee's work. Wow. Damn. The tremendous success of the broadcast led to the production of a cycle of expose crime films dealing with the dismantling of complex criminal organizations by law enforcement. Right. First one of these was Captive City in 1952, which had the blessing of Senator Cavaver himself. Director Robert Wise took a print of the film to D.C. He did that to show the senator who not only endorsed it, but even appears in the prologue and epilogue, cautioning audience about the evils of organized crime. Oh, geez. What is this like? A, um, <laughs> um, reefer madness? Type right. deal? The dare movement. All right. The notable examples of expose films inspired by the hearings include Hoodlum Empire, 1952, The Turning Point, who starred uh, Marlon Brando. Nobody. I'm sure they were known bad. Brian time. Donlevy, The Turning Point, Dittiere. Nobody. Starring William Holden. 
decent guy. A fictionalized version of the Senate hearings is a central plot device in the 1974 film Godfather Part Dos, featuring testimony by Marco Col- Michael Corleone, now head of the Corleone crime family, and disgruntled family capo regime Frank Pangangeli. All right, the Cathalver hearings, huh? I guess. Costello was convicted in these hearings of contempt of the Senate and oh. sentenced to 18 months in prison. Dang. Assuming he didn't want to show up or something. Senator Cafalver concluded that politician Carmine DeSapio was assisting the activities of Costello and that Costello had become influential in decisions made by the Tammany Hall Council. Oh, no shit. Really? Uh, DeSapio, or DeSapio, admitted to having met Costello several times but insisted that politics was never discussed, he says. Yeah, I'm sure it wasn't. There's more other things. Right. <laughs> right. It's not politics, just criminal right. activities. 1952, the government began proceedings to strip Costello of his U.S. citizenship, and he was indicted for evasion of his $73,417 in income taxes between 1946 and 49. Wow. It's a hell of a lot of income tax. And those just three years. You kidding? He was sentenced to five years in prison and fined twenty thousand dollars. Okay, nineteen fifty four. Casello appealed the conviction and was released on fifty thousand dollar bail. And from fifty two to sixty one, he was in and out of a half dozen federal and local prisons and jails. His confinement interrupted by periods when he was out on bail pending determination of appeals. Oh my! He's doing just go. It's in and out, in and out. Wow. Nineteen fifty six. Adonis, a powerful Costello ally. Joe Adonis. He chose deportation to Italy over a long prison sentence. A lot of them didn't, couldn't go back to Italy, though, man. They'd be dead within two days. Well, not, maybe not only that, but they knew they weren't getting in. Especially Costello. He ain't going back they to They knew Italy. they weren't getting into uh, no other stuff. Like Lucky and Genovese could do it. Right. Uh, Adonis' uh, departure left Costello weakened. Yeah. But Genovese still had to neutralize one more powerful Costello ally, Anastasia. Who had taken over the Mangano crime family after the disappearance of his boss, Vincent Mangano, and the murder of his brother, Philip Mangano, on the 14th of April, 1951. Right. Early 1957. I don't think it says it here, but I'm pretty sure Vincent Mangano disappears for, like, it's literally like seven, six, seven years, and he comes back. Right. <laughs> Just, I don't even know where he went. I'm back. Hey, guys. Does he take over his boss again? No. Mm. He still in the family, though. Early 1957, Genovese decided to move on Costello. Genovese ordered Vincent Gigante to murder Costello. And on May 2nd, 1957, Gigante shot and wounded Costello in the head outside his apartment building. Yup. Hey, well, they having a little problems there. Uh, Genovese wanted to take over. I guess, yeah. But then he, uh, remember he fled to Italy because he was on trial? It's true. Yeah, and then he come back. Right. And was like, I want to take over now. Right, right, right. This altercation persuaded Costello to relinquish power to Genovese and retire. Yep. Genovese then controlled what is now called the Genovese crime family. A doorman identified Gigante as the gunman, but in 1958, Costello testified that he was unable to recognize his assailant, and Gigante was acquitted of attempted murder. Of course, he ain't going to say anything. Right. He, got, he got out of the game with, with right. his life. Well, did he, though? October 25th, 1957, Anastasia was murdered at the barbershop of the Park Sheridan Uh-oh. Hotel at 56th Street and 7th Avenue in Manhattan. Carlo Gambino was expected to be proclaimed boss of Anastasia's family at the November 14th, 1957 Appalachian meeting. Oh, look at that. And it obviously called the Gambino crime family. So. Right. Well, Genovese called to discuss the future of the Cosa Nostra in light of his takeover. When the police raided the meeting, two of the detriment of to the detriment of Genovese's reputation, Gambino's appointment was postponed to a later meeting in New York City. Gambino's like, shit, come on. They very still recognize Right, that. obviously. 1959, Genovese was convicted of selling a large quantity of heroin. <laughs> Dummy. April 8, Why 7- is he selling it? <laughs> right. April 17th, 1959, Genovese was sentenced to 15 years in Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. This was in Atlanta, Georgia. Obviously. Clearly. <laughs> Atlanta, Michigan. Uh, during his retirement, Costello was still known as the Prime Minister of the Underworld. He still retained power and influence in New York's mafia and remained busy throughout his final years. Nice. Cosa That's Nostra. Sweet. Cosa Nostra bosses and so older. That means every time he got bags of money from everybody. Don't they give bags of money out to the guys like that when they see him? You just get a you just get a envelope full of money. <laughs> there you go. A couple hundo. Uh, Costa Nostra bosses and old associates such as Gambino and Lucchese still paid visits to Costello at his Wardorf Astoria penthouse seeking advice on important mafia affairs. 
Costello's old friend, Meyer Lansky, also kept in touch. Good for you. Mm. Costello occupied himself with gardening and displayed some of his flowers at local dude, uh, horticultural shows. This dude is him. a made man. He is untouchable from here on out. And, and plus, why would anybody want to kill him? Because he's nothing, really. Pretty sure he still had control of, like, little things. He was still making money. All right. 20th of February, 1961, the United States Supreme Court. They upheld a lower court order that stripped Costello of his U.S. citizenship. But on February 17th, 1964, the same court set aside a deportation order for Costello, citing a legal technicality. Hmm. February of 1973, Costello suffered a heart attack. He did this in his Manhattan home and was rushed to the doctor's hospital. <laughs> <laughs> doctor's hospital. Just doctor's hospital. All right. <laughs> He was rushed to the hospital in Manhattan, where he died on the 18th of February. Damn. Costello's sedate memorial service at a Manhattan funeral home was attended by 50 relatives, friends, and law enforcement agents. <laughs> Why them? <laughs> like, make sure this bastard's finally put in the ground, I guess. Right. Huh? <laughs> well, he's interred in a private mausoleum in St. Michael Cemetery in East Elmhurst, Queens. 1974, after his enemy, Carmine Galante, was released from prison, he allegedly ordered the bombing of the doors to Costello's mausoleum. Whoa. Just to prove that I'm still your enemy just because you're dead doesn't right. mean nothing. Uh, that's crazy. Costello has been portrayed in several movies, including My Brother Anastasia in 1973, Gangster Wars in 1981, Bugsy in 1991, Mobsters in 1991, um, and the television movie Kingfish, a story of Huey P. Long in 1995. I think he'd be in a lot more than that. Right. He was also referenced in the Allen Ginsberg poem, Had to Be Playing on the Jukebox. The line is written... It had to be FBI Chief J. Edgar Boover and Frank Costello Syndicate mouthpiece. Meeting in Central Park, New York Weekends, reported Time Magazine. Not really a great poem. Right. The poem was later performed live with music by the band Rage Against the Machine on the album Live and Rare. Okay. And Rage Against the Machine, the whole thing, now their whole message is not even close to what their music was. Right. Isn't that crazy. The film Departed, The Departed, features an Irish mob boss named Frank Costello, played by Jackie Nicholson <laughs> in present day Boston. His character is related to the real life Costello in name only because he was based on Whitey Bulger. Obviously. Costello was portrayed by Anthony DiCarlo in AMC's docudrama The Making of the Mob in New York. He was portrayed by Paul Sorvino, who plays Paulie in Goodfellas yeah. uh, in the 2019 television series Godfather of Harlem. And he's going to be portrayed by Robert De Niro in the upcoming film Wise Guys, not released yet. That sucks. Look at Wise Guys. He plays a dual role as uh, Vito Genovese and Frank Costello. In Wise Guys? Nice. Yep. So it's going to be a movie about those guys beefing with each other. Good for them, Sweet. huh? Neat. Dude, he's like 87 years old. Deborah Messing. Uh, Catherine Narducci. She's uh, Artie Bucco's wife in uh, Sopranos. And then Cosmo Jarvis. Don't know who you are, guy. I'm Joe Pesci. No, no. <laughs> hey. no, no Ray Liotta. <laughs> he did. Dead. He did. And that's going to wrap it up for the story of Frank Costello. A short and sweet one for him. Because uh, not much really going on with this guy's life. He did some things, and he got uh, attempted assassination, and then he's gone to suffer a heart attack. Well, he lived out a couple years I mean, he lived in until peace. 1970 something. Right. He was born in 1891, so I think he did very well for himself. Right. Uh, good for him. But next week's episode will be all about his rival, and uh, who has a little bit more. Uh, a little bit more of a story to well, him. That's why it's the Genovese family, not the uh, Costello family. Exactly. So Vito Genovese is going to be the focus of next week's episode. But before we get there, we'd like to uh, announce a little bit of our next upcoming show that we got going on. Hmm. If some of you guys might know, we do a show called This Week in Sports History. Well, we've uh, wrapping up a year of that. Can't go any further. Which we got about three more episodes left, so that one's done and over with. And replacing that one is going to be a show called According to Wikipedia, and it sounds just like it is According to Wikipedia. We go on the web and search up random Wikipedia articles. It could be uh, an article about the invention of a coffee cup. It right. could be, and then the next ep or, uh, article could be the brewing of Captain Morgan. You never know what we're going to uh, get into. No... No common theme. The only common theme is that it comes from Wikipedia. So right. we'll think of it as uh, 
we're just reading Wikipedia articles to you guys. So you guys want to learn something new? You'll learn with us just like this. <laughs> Pretty much what we do here, just with, with, with random articles. No, we'll change to show up a little bit, the format. We'll change it up a little bit. I don't know how we're going to change the format of what the hell is What do you mean we're going to change the format of? It's going to be literally the same exact format, dude. So, <laughs> if you guys like this show. Yeah, but we're, we might rabbit hole into something on the on right. our subject. We yeah, because these shows, we try not to rabbit hole right. off of what we're doing. But those who could get into something else, that's for sure. Yeah. You never know. But we I'll could, tell you. We could start off talking about butterflies, monarch butterflies, and end up right. talking about Komodo dragon eating a deer. This I don't right, know. This uh, this show is going to debut next week if you're listening to this right now. Um, so first show is going to be all about, we're going to have three topics here. We'll try to keep it about an hour long. So the first topics are going to be genetic rescue, which is a mitigation strategy designed to restore genetic diversity and reduce extinction risks in small, isolated, and frequently inbred populations. Hey, look at that. Okay, and then we'll have a story on the SS Vienna, which is a uh, ship built in 1873 during the era when steamers were built with sail rigging. Oh, shit. And then, see, I told you, random, and then we'll finish it off with um, the story of Heron Island, which is a coral cay located near the Tropic of Capricorn in the southern Great Barrier Reef. Which is uh, by Australia. So, huh. like I said, oh, it's going to be really uh, different and no one topic. So, learn some things with us. We'll see. Uh, we might not get off the first uh, topic. <laughs> right. You never know. Cause oh, we could read something in this genetic rescue uh, stuff. And then we'll start looking up weirdos from Arizona. Right. And, uh, uh, Area Fifty One. Well, even the, even the second the episode, testing. Even the second episode we have planned. There's a, a article about artificial cranial deformation, where um, mostly like African tribes and those like would tie rubber bands or something around uh, their kids' head so to elongate it. And we might right. we might the ones go off on that. The, the rings on their neck. Right. Their neck becomes twenty feet long. But you never know. But that's the whole uh, concept of according to Wikipedia. This is the world according to Wikipedia. So. Can't uh, nobody can complain about? Oh, you guys didn't get this. You guys didn't get this. The whole show is this is according to Wikipedia. And this will be so. our first show where it's actually worldwide and not just all America. Right, that's true too. We're, we're American boys. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope to see you then. We'll give you all the details. We'll drop the uh, link in the description of this episode for uh, where you can find that, and we'll be sure to um, advertise it pretty heavily on the next few uh, episodes of this. We'll be back next week for Vito Genovese, the namesake of the Genovese crime family. Lots more to go with this family. We'll see you then. We are the Mother Michiganders with...